a very good afternoon students today uh, i am dr sangamita das and today i'll be talking about the various modes of entry into the international market so in this we'll first uh, the various learning objectives over here will be that first we'll talk about the various common international expansion entry modes uh, you will be able to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each entry mode then you'll be able to understand the dynamics among the choice of different entry modes so let us start with the first one that whenever you thinking of entering into the international market first what are the things that will think so the first thing that comes to your mind is what is the best way to enter a new market should a company first establish an export base and then it should proceed on with licensing franchising or it should go for an investment or does the potential associated market can you get a first movers advantage over there and that means nobody else has entered that market earlier you will be the one will be entering the first uh, as a marketer and you can get the advantage many companies move from exporting then they start with licensing and franchising and they actually move up the ladder then and each and every uh, mode of expansion actually has its advantages and disadvantages so according to your uh, business you will have to decide that which is the expansion mode which is best suitable for you so in order to enter into an international market first thing that, that you should do is first you should know whether that particular market is accessible for you or not whether you are having a lot of distance if the distance can be geographical distance it can be economical distance so you have to assess that whether it is to that particular market is accessible to you or not whether it is actually uh can you sell your products over there or not so these are the various things is the market measurable for you or not so these are the various things you have to think about while you are entering into the international market so we start with the first one that is exporting uh, exporting actually is the very basic way of entering into an international market so exporting is the marketing direct sale of domestically produced goods in another country so you are producing it domestically and you are without any changes you are selling it the same product into the international market so exporting is actually a traditional and well established method of reaching the foreign markets because it does not require the goods to be produced in the target market so no investment is required so this is one thing that requires the least investment so most of the cost that are associated with exporting take the form of marketing expenses so firms export mostly to countries that are very close to their facilities because of the lower transportation cost and often greater similarity between geographic neighbors for example mexico accounts for 40% of the goods that are exported from texas so exporting is the very basic way of entering into the foreign market because it is actually not requiring any expense it is not requiring any additional investment you are just producing it is like an extended market it you can say an extended domestic market just taking the products from your domestic market into the international market okay now let's uh, uh, talk about some examples one common factor in exporting is the need to translate something about a product or service into the language of the target country so while this may seem to be very simple it's often a source of very embarrassment for the company and humor for the competitors you can take the following english or you can say the following example you can see for that the following anecdote for us companies doing business in the neighboring french speaking canadian province of quebec a company boasted of lat phrase usage which translate to used fresh milk and when it meant to brag of lat phrase employ or fresh milk is used so the meaning is totally different so whether it is an exporting also when you are entering into the foreign market you have to think of the translation in the language and what is the meaning actually they are getting from the language that you are entering with then we talk about licensing and franchising an international licensing agreement allows a foreign company that is the licensee to sell the product of a producer that is the licensor or to use its intellectual property such as patents trademarks copyrights in exchange for royalty fees so here you just uh, i'll tell you how it is working you own a company in the us that sells coffee flavored popcorn so you are sure that your product would be a big hit in japan but you won't don't have the resource to set up a factory over there or sales office to set up in japan so you can't make the popcorn here and ship it to japan because it would get stale then so you enter into a licensing agreement with a japanese company that allows your license to manufacture coffee flavored popcorns using a special process and to sell it in japan under your brand name 
in exchange the japanese licensee would pay you a royalty so this is after exporting this is one mode of entry into the foreign market where, where you require very less amount of investment then we come to franchising so under an international franchise agreement a company the franchisor grants a foreign company that is the franchisee the right to use its brand name and to sell its products or services so the franchisee is responsible for all the operations but agrees to operate according to business established by the franchisor in turn the franchisor usually provides advertising and new product assistance so this is also a very good mode of entering into the foreign market for the newcomers or the new people who are entering into the international market because they are actually getting the business model that how they are going to do their business in the international market so it happens that this also requires less amount of investment then we come to contract manufacturing and outsourcing so because of high you can say that because of the high domestic labor costs many us companies manufacture the products in countries where labor costs are very low so the actually the arrangement is called international contract manufacturing or outsourcing a us company might contract with a local company in a foreign country to manufacture one of its products it will however retain control of product design and development and put its own label on the finished product contract manufacturing is quite common in the us mostly apparel business with most american brands being made in number of asian countries including china vietnam indonesia and india because over here you can see that the cost of the labor is lower so that is the cost of the products becomes low next one is partnership and strategic alliance a strategic alliance involves a contractual agreement between two or more enterprises stipulating that the involving parties will cooperate in a certain way for a certain time to achieve a common purpose to determine if the alliance approach is suitable for the firm the firm must decide what value the partner could bring to the venture in terms of both tangible and intangible assets aspects for example cisco formed a strategic alliance with fujitsu to develop routers for Japan in the alliance Cisco decided to co-brand with Fujitsu name so that it could leverage Fujitsu's reputation in Japan for IT equipment and solutions while still retaining the Cisco name to benefit from Cisco's global reputation for switches and routers so this is an example of your strategic alliance then you can say that a strategic alliance is actually an agreement between two companies or a company and a nation to pool the resources in order to achieve business goals that benefit both the partners for example viacom which is a leading global media company has a strategic alliance with beijing television to produce chinese language music and entertainment programming such alliances often are favorable when the partners strategic goals coverage while their competitive goals diverge and the partner size market power and resources are small compared to the industry leaders the partners are able to learn from one another while limiting access to their own proprietary skills so an alliance can serve a number of purposes it can increase your marketing efforts it can help you to build your sales and market shares it helps you to improve the products it helps in reducing production and distribution costs as well as you are sharing the technology also so partnership in emerging markets can be used for social good as well For example, pharmaceutical company Novartis crafted multiple partnerships with suppliers and manufacturers and manufacturers to develop test and produced anti-malaria medicine on a non-profit basis. The partners included several Chinese suppliers and manufacturing partners as well as farm in Kenya that grows the medication Skiri, the key raw ingredient. So, the potential problem over here is that the key issues you can say in a joint venture are ownership control length of agreement pricing technology transfer local firm capabilities and resources and government intentions so the potential problem include conflict over asymmetric new investment mistrust over proprietary knowledge performance ambiguity that is how to split the pie lack of parents firm support cultural clashes are there if how and when to terminate the relationship so these are the various problems that can arise when you are going for a partnership or a joint venture 
Now, if talk about acquisition, an acquisition is a transaction in which a firm gains control over another firm by purchasing its stock, exchanging the stock for its own, or in the case of a private firm, paying the owners of a purchase price. Over here, I have given the example of USA Network. Okay. Next, we talk about foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment, acquisition, and meaningful startups involve the direct ownership of facilities in the tar target country. And therefore, the transfer of resources, including capital, technology, and personnel also takes place. So, foreign direct investment actually refers to the for formal establishment of business operations on foreign soil. The building of the factories, the sales offices, and distribution networks to serve local markets in a nation other than the company's home country. So we talk, you can see over here that how the FDI is working. You can see over here the developing countries, the developed country and the world. So through 2008, developing countries received substantially less in for FDI than did the developed country. Probably because they did not offer attractive investment climates. But in 2009, things changed and the developing countries in particular China and India received close to half of the global foreign direct investment because they found that India and China, because of the huge population has a great potential to be a good market. Now talk about wholly owned subsidiaries. So firms may want to have a direct operating presence in the foreign country completely under their control. To achieve this, the company can establish a new wholly owned subsidiary that is a greenfield venture from scratch or it can purchase an existing country, an existing company also in that country. So the firm must assume all the risk financial risk, then you can see the currency, the economic and the political. So it affords the maximum control and has the most potential to provide above average returns. So you must also know that McDonald's has a plant in Italy that supplies all the buns for Magdi's restaurants in Italy, Greece and Malta. International sales has accounted as for as much as 60% of McDonald's annual revenue. Then, in case, you have to build also a long-term relationship. So, building long-term relationship may include keep, keeping people in the countries long enough to form good ties since a deal negotiated with one person may fall apart if that person returns too quickly to the headquarter. So, it is very much necessary that you have to maintain a very good or a long-term relationship. Otherwise, your alliance with the other countries, people will learn, will end into a failure. China is a relationship-based society, so relationships extend well beyond the personal side and can drive business as well. So, with Gunaxi, a person invests with relationships much like one would invest with capital. In a sense, it's akin to the Western phrase, you owe me one. So, this is a way the China is actually having a... Uh, China is a country which has a very long-term relationship. So, they try to maintain the relationship in business as well. So, when you're entering into the uh, foreign market, you have to think that which mode of entry you should choose. So the company should actually ask them mainly these two questions. How much of our resources are we willing to commit for international entry? The fewer the resources, that is the money, time and expertise the company wants or can afford to devote, the better it is for the company to enter the foreign market on a contractual basis through licensing, franchising, management contracts or turnkey projects. So, how much control do we wish to retain? So, these are the main questions that a company must ask that how much of our resources are we willing to commit for the international market? And secondly, how much control do we wish to retain after entering into the foreign market? So, the more control a company wants, the better off it is establishing or buying a wholly owned subsidiary or at least entering via joint venture with carefully delineating the responsibilities and accountabilities between the partner companies. So the various factors that one has to keep in mind while entering into the foreign market is the cultural and the linguistic differences. These affect all relationships and interactions inside the company with the customers and with the government. So understanding the local business culture is very critical to the success of your marketing. Then secondly, quality and training of local contacts or employees is also very necessary. So you have to evaluate the skill sets and then determine if the local staff is qualified and can it be a key factor for your success? 
the next one is political and economic issues because the policies actually keep on changing frequently and the companies need to determine what level of investment they are willing to make what's required to make this investment and how much of their earnings can they repatriate and experience of the partner company assessing the experience of the partner company in this market is also very much necessary with the product and in dealing with foreign companies it is essential in selecting the right local partner when you are entering into the foreign market so the companies which want to enter into the foreign market have to consider the following the research should be done in the foreign market thoroughly and learn about the country and its culture it should understand the unique business and regulatory relationships that impact their industries use the internet to identify and communicate with appropriate foreign trade corporations in the country or with the government embassy in that country each embassy has its own trade and commercial desk for example the us embassy has a foreign commercial desk with officers who assist us companies on how best to enter the local market these resources are best for smaller companies larger companies with more money and resources usually hire top consultants to do this for them they are also able to have a dedicated team assigned to the foreign country that can travel the country frequently for the later stage entry strategies that involve investment because actually in the initial stage what do people do they enter through the exporting mode only after that only after they is to have a foothold in the market foreign market then only they wish to try to invest much more or you can say they wish to try into go into a joint venture or it, they can enter into the market through acquisition but the initial stage is always mostly it is exporting for the businesses which are of a smaller size if we talk about entrepreneurship and strategy the chinese always have a say have an attitude why not me so the, they see the entrepreneur china as entrepreneurial people at the grassroots level who are very independent minded they are very quick on their feet they are prone to fearless experimentation imitating other companies here and there and they try new ideas and then if they fail rapidly adapt and move on so that is why you can see as a result you can see that china is becoming not only a very large consumer market but also a very strong innovator because they easily imitate other countries products as well as they have the technical bent of mind where they start producing or they innovate the products which they can manufacture so therefore the advice is us firms to enter china sooner rather than later so that you can take advantage of the opportunities over there so you can say that china has a very good entrepreneurial brand of mind and because of this entrepreneurial brand of mind they actually apply a lot of strategies for entering into the entering into the foreign markets and having a uh, capture on the particular market Now, if we talk about the various advantages and disadvantages of the modes of entry, so if we are entering through the export mode, then it is the entry is very fast. You have a lower risk of entry, but the main disadvantage is that you have low control, low low local knowledge is there. The potential environment can be negative also on the transportation. Now, if we talk about licensing and franchising, the entry is very fast. It is also it also requires low cost and low risk. if we talk about the disadvantage there is lesser control licensee may become a competitor because he is already learning a business model then you have to check the legal and the regulatory environment as well now if a person wishes to enter through the partnering and the strategic alliance he can have the advantage of shared cost reduced investment needed reduced risk seen as a local entity but the disadvantage is that higher cost than exporting okay licensing or franchising so licensing you can say exporting licensing or franchising are having the least cost then problem of integration also arises between two cor- different corporate cultures so this is the problem with partnership and strategic alliance then if a company wishes to enter through acquisition there also you have a very fast entry mode it is known it is established operation because you are acquiring another company so already it is having a very established operation mode but the main disadvantage is that the cost is very high integration issues with the home office is always there then in case you are wishing to enter to the greenfield venture then what will happen you can go again local market knowledge 
you can be seen as an insider who employs locals and you can have a maximum control but the main disadvantage lying over here is that it can be it can involve high cost it can involve also high risk due to unknown because you do not know the foreign market the entry can be slow because the setup time is small so whichever mode of entry wish to end we wish to apply for entering into the foreign market it has its own advantages and its dis disadvantages so before entering into the foreign market it is very mu much necessary for a for a person to do a thorough research that whether actually it is beneficial for him to enter into the foreign market or not and then only think that which is the best mode of entry for that particular person to enter into the foreign market so this is these are all this is all from my side as regarding selection of the mode of entry into the foreign market okay students thank you